Thanks to everybody who asked questions. This is part one of four. Many of the answers are in videos I've done in the past. You can find past videos by going to eagerspace.net and searching around. On to the questions. What are the primary obstacles to manufacturing a cheaper RL-10? The biggest obstacle is that L3 Harris bought Aerojet Rocketdyne to make money, so their goal is to sell RL-10 engines at a price point that maximizes their profit. ULA reportedly got a major reduction in price for the large contract for Vulcan to launch Kuiper satellites, assuming that contract happens. The RL-10 is very much an old-style engine. It would be a lot cheaper if they went with a different design for a nozzle. But it's not clear if L3 Harris would ever make back the investment in doing a cheaper version. Their customers are mostly ULA and maybe NASA. And that's it. Why don't we see more coaxial tanks in general? Coaxial tanks, where you have one tank inside another, require that you have propellants that have compatible temperatures. Liquid oxygen and propane work but LOX will freeze RP1 or liquid methane, and liquid hydrogen will freeze LOX. What role will government space agencies play in the future with the rise of commercial space stations and the development of private space stations? NASA has been trying to figure out how to jumpstart private space stations, but they have been unable to come up with a model that makes sense for the commercial providers. Why aren't rotary detonating rocket engines mainstream yet? Are they the graphene of the rocket world? They aren't mainstream because nobody has built a functional engine that can replace existing rocket engine designs. At some point I'll probably talk about them, but right now they're in the same class as the Aerospike engines. Lots of interest, lots of research, nothing practical yet. Starship will stage quite early to facilitate super heavy recovery, especially V3. Analysis and Delta V lost for suboptimal staging? I talk about it a bit in my Starship optimization video, though I don't do the actual numbers. Staging early is an optimization that reduces the Delta V used for first stage recovery, and therefore maximizes payload to orbit. Similar to your recent video on current and upcoming rockets, one on current and upcoming space stations, both US and non-US. Here are a couple of videos for the U.S. side. No plans to do anything on China's program. Why were the shuttles so freaking expensive? Was it because of its architecture or something like that? Go watch this video. I think it covers it pretty well. Can you do a video on kick stages? A couple videos for you to watch. Without the mass of the Starship, grid fins and actuators and a bunch of the now surplus Raptor engines would Super Heavy have enough Delta V to turn the booster into a single stage to orbit and create either a massive orbital refueling depot or a gigantic wet lab habitat. I dug out my Starship Excel model, one that is painfully out of date, and it told me you could get about 20 pounds to low Earth orbit with Super Heavy. That's low enough that the number could easily be zero with some different assumptions. But let's just assume that Super Heavy can get into orbit. During shuttle, NASA did a number of studies looking at reusing space shuttle external tanks, and nobody on the commercial side was interested. The problem is that you just end up with big empty tanks, and that is pretty much zero utility in orbit. You would need to lift everything to make them habitable and spend a ton of expensive astronaut time setting them up. Is there a reason landers aren't using nuclear power anymore? Seems like one of the most common failure modes, especially for the moon landers, is they freeze overnight without sunlight to keep batteries charged. Plutonium-238 costs about $4 million per pound, and the U.S. stopped making it for years. There's no real stockpile and the U.S. is hoping to create 1.5 kilograms per year. Nuclear material requires extensive planning and reviews before launch. And it's difficult for commercial entities to obtain and use. It's enough of a hassle that NASA decided to use solar panels for Europa Clipper despite the low intensity of the sun at Europa. Why hasn't NASA decided to contract its CLIPS partners for HLS? 
Human landing systems are a couple orders of magnitude more complex and expensive than the current CLIPS landers. Why didn't Congress understand the risks of Lunar Starship and its mission architecture? Congress doesn't care about missions. They care about money flowing into their districts and money flowing into their re-election campaigns. SLS and Orion didn't even have a mission associated with it when Congress spun them up in 2010. How do you think we should compare how good rockets are at a job? A dedicated crew starship wouldn't take 100 tons of cargo with it, but a crew and cargo starship combined could obliterate the total payload for shuttle crew and cargo-wise. How would we compare something like that? It's all about the market and the missions that you are designing for. Markets care about price, reliability, schedule, and other factors. Better means better on at least one factor compared to other options for a specific market. Do you think a lunar economy is viable? Could NASA actually kickstart it? NASA has been talking a lot about the lunar economy, but this talk has been weak on details. A lunar economy is inherently about markets for materials on the moon and being able to produce those materials economically on the lunar surface. We're a long way from that. Is a disposable Starship third stage an option that is carried inside the ship? And what could we do with it? And would it be worth it? Sure, it's just a kick stage approach. See this video. Dude, what's the deal with the Russians? What's the future of the Russian space program? It's unfortunately very bleak. You might want to watch this video if you haven't, but Russia is in a really poor position. Their program used to run on Western currency and that's not flowing to them anymore. And they're trying to fight a very costly war. The fact that they've stuck in the ISS program despite the worst US-Russian relations in decades is a good indication that they currently have no alternative. When the ISS goes away, they could fly individual Soyuz missions, but not much else. It's also important to note that nobody is going to trust them with commercial payloads since, since they stole 36 satellites from OneWeb. What happens if Starship fails? If they can't get heat shield working, have a big accident, etc. What are the consequences for SpaceX and the entire space industry? Right now it looks like Starlink is throwing off enough money that they can keep trying things until they get something to work and they seem fine flying Falcon 9 to keep Starlink expanding. I think it's unlikely that they would abandon it, as they really, really care about Mars. When do you think Starship will land on the moon? And when do you expect the major milestones to happen along the way? Could Starship be used in an expendable configuration to reduce refueling flights? Here's the problem. From the contract, we know what the various milestones are for the HLS lander but we don't know any of the dates or the payment amounts, nor do we know the success criteria. So it's mostly a black hole. We know they'll do an uncrewed test, but that depends heavily on how Starship testing progresses, and I have no real prediction on that. With respect to expendable flights, it's certainly possible, but would require throwing away a lot of tankers. And here's a more detailed ask. To my knowledge, according to SpaceX's contract with NASA, SpaceX must meet a number of major milestones before landing crew on the surface of the moon. All the information you're looking for is redacted. You can see the name of a milestone in the HLS contract, but pretty much all the useful information is redacted. Even if it wasn't, I have no way to estimate when milestones may be hit. How did the APUs on the X-15 and the space shuttle work? The shuttle auxiliary power units used hydrazine as a propellant. Pass the hydrazine over a metallic catalyst and it is converted to gas, and that drives the turbine in the APU. The X-15 was similar, but it used hydrogen peroxide instead. Could you cover SpaceX's choice of argon thrusters over krypton thrusters for V2 plus Starlink satellites? Big topic, probably a separate video. The short answer is that argon is very cheap compared to krypton and xenon. It's a lower thrust solution, but Starlink doesn't need a ton of thrust, and argon gives a higher specific impulse. Would a Dragon Starship work for Artemis instead of Orion Starship? For example, for a small reduction in payload capacity, the HLS Starship and Crew Dragon dock in LEO then head to the moon, 
and do the rest of the mission as if Orion was used, but with Dragon instead. See my commercial moon video. There are alternatives, but Dragon doesn't have a heat shield designed to deal with lunar return velocity. Orbital industry at scale is only possible with some large space station with huge docking capability. The station would serve as a transit point for mined minerals from lunar and asteroid sources, as well as Earth to space transport. What would be the optimal orbit for such a station? It's going to depend on what the market is. If it's in space, you probably want to avoid getting too deep in the gravity well. If it's Earth-related, you want to be close to Earth, and you'll also need to figure out what inclination you want, and that's going to depend on where your launch sites are. What do you think of raccoons? Rockets launch from balloons. Are there potential cost benefits compared to conventional airplane-based air launches? It's the same issues as with airplane-based launches, but worse. It gets you altitude, but no useful horizontal velocity, so you can only reduce your rocket size by a small amount. But you have a balloon that you can't control well that has to lift a rocket that is nearly the same size as the ground launch version. And you are more subject to winds and need to figure out how to get your launch platform back. Far easier just to make your first stage a little bigger. What is the most promising surface-to-orbit propulsion tech that isn't a chemical rocket? I don't think there are any. A probe is launched from Earth. A fueled up tug rendezvous with said probe and boosts it to, let's say, trans Jupiter injection. The tug separates from the probe and boosts back to Leo long before it exits Earth's sphere of influence. It rendezvous with the depot where it is refueled for the next mission. I don't actually see a question here, so I'm going to assume it's about the architecture. I encourage you to do the math here yourself. Maybe start with the Impulse Aerospace Kick stage. I think you will find that you pay a huge penalty getting the tug back into LEO and to the depot. And that's it for the first set of questions. If you enjoyed this video, listen to this.